Apostle Paul said that he knew no man after the flesh and that he put no confidence in the flesh, but one of the joys <coughs> I've had these many years going from one church to another <coughs> is meeting <coughs> fine young preachers. Nothing on earth that I treasure more than God raising up young men who are preaching now what their granddaddies used to preach. And that's a step in the right direction. Some uh, liberal criticized Billy Graham and said that he took us backward 200 years. And Billy answered and said he aimed to take us back to the New Testament. And that was good at least. Now I attempt to do something tonight that I criticize others for. Some years since, <clears throat> when we were at a low ebb, sure enough, spiritually in the United States, we had a rash of exes into the field of evangelism. Ex-convicts and ex-con men and ex pickpockets and ex-movie stars and ex you couldn't preach unless she was an ex you know I sometimes wondered what poor old Paul would do he wasn't he never had robbed the bank that got out on him or anything like that and I didn't like that because I heard some of them and they seemed to glorify what big shots they used to be when they were in rebellion and we don't like that but in spite of that I trust the Lord will be pleased as I seek to bring a word of testimony tonight about how God did for me what he has to do for every human being if he saves them. God has to cross and crush man's will at the point where his rebellion heads up and if God wins in that battle, a man is saved. And if the man wins the battle, he'll have to go to hell for his trouble. In the book of the Psalms, at chapter 14 and verse 1, <clears throat> we have our scripture. Psalms 14, just the first <clears throat> sentence of the first verse of Psalms 14. If you have your pencils, I hope you'll <clears throat> use them tonight on your Bible, especially if you have before you, as I have, the authorized, or what we call the King James Version. There's people there who translated this version from the original manuscripts have put in this sentence two words in italics. The school children can tell us older people if we do not know it already that where you find in the Bible some words italicized they do not occur in the oldest manuscripts we have. We do not have the original pieces of paper upon which the Bible was written. We all understand that, but to go back, way back younger. And in this sentence, they put in two words that make the rest of the Bible just silly. If, as I read now from the authorized version, that this is what the Bible actually teaches, then we just have to throw the whole thing out because if you'll just notice it once, the fool has said in his heart, he's got too much sense to say it in his head, but in his heart, that means the thing that makes him tick. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if that is so, then we got no Bible. Or if there's one thing that's dead certain, it is that there has never lived a human being on the list good hour who did not believe that there was a God. And yet here, yeah, apparently, the Bible is saying the fool, he's different. He said in his heart, 
there is no God. But the words there is are in italics. And since it is true that God has done two or three things at least for every human being, one of them, he's given them a God consciousness. Men know there is a supreme power. They just know it. They're just like, I used to listen to Amos and Andy way back yonder when they were the rage of the radio 30, 40 years ago. And uh, Andy was always talking about a woman's ignition. He meant her intuition, the most powerful argument any man ever went up against was when a woman answers for something she's done and says, just cause, just cause. You can't do a thing except bow to it. You just, just, just cause. A woman's intuition. Now, a man's intuition, he can't brag about it because it's given him of God, is that he knows there is a supreme being. Now, he may call himself an atheist, but he don't believe it. We read about atheistic communism. Don't you believe a word of it? There ain't no such animal as a human being who actually believes there is no God. But if you read this verse without the italics, and, and translate it literally from the original language. It reads like this. The fool has said in his heart, No God for me. As far as I'm concerned, there shall be nobody ruling in my life. Nobody's going to tell me what to do or what not to do. Now that makes sense, for that's a description of every human being that ever lived, apart from the triumphal grace and overpowering mercy of God. Men and women, boys and girls, are sending up messages every time they take a breath to the supreme being and said as far as I'm concerned no God for me I will not submit to your rule that cry was first heard in the garden of Eden when you and I in the loins of our father Abraham in such a way I can't understand it that the scriptures say that Ralph Barnard had as much a part in it as did Adam and that Brother Parks and Brother Whaley and Brother Barnard and Brother a whole lot of you folks out there, we rolled up our sleeves and spat on our hands and attempted to push God off the throne and mounted ourselves, saying we will not be under the restriction of a power from on high. That's the same cry that could be heard by the angels and make them weep and the demons to make them tremble when they hung the Lord Jesus Christ on a cross and sent a messenger after him and told the God of heaven that they hadn't changed their minds. They still were saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's the cry of lawless rebellion that goes up from the mouths of every human being. No God for me. No God for me. I was born a rebel against authority. Men haven't got a thing on God's earth against God except his authority. If he'd resign as the moral universe, governor of the universe, if he would change his character and put on some side whiskers and be an old doting grandfather and wink at sin and turn the reins of the world over to me, he and I get along just fine. But since he will not do that, the carnal mind is hostile to him and it's not subject to the law of God, neither it can it be. We were 
born in a state of rebellion. The little child nestling in the mother's arms proves its rebellious nature by uh, kicking the gas anything that smells like authority. The best way on God's earth to get your child out of the house, sweet it is. The best way on earth to see to it that your child does something is to tell them not to. They'll bust hell and heaven wide open to do something if somebody in authority tells them not to. Why? It's their nature. It's their nature. My mother used to tell me how you could tell the difference between when the child was hurt and when it's mad. When it just boiled up a storm, not a tear in its eye. It's just mad. It's just trying to get at God. And since it can't get at God, it'll claw at Papa or Mama or whoever lays the law down. Never was there a generation so reeking with the spirit of lawless rebellion against the authority of God as today we were born rebels. Now, ladies and gentlemen, according to the Bible, rebellion challenges the character of Almighty God, and he has to do something about rebellion. And since I've looked in the back of the book and have got the answer, I don't have to tear along over the problem. The Bible certainly is crystal clear that the rebellion in every human heart is going to be crushed. God's going to put down the rebellion. And Almighty God's going to win the war. And when the last battle has been fought on the throne, will be the Lord God omnipotent. There's no doubt about that. There's not a question on earth. No human being is ever going to win in this war. We differ a great deal as I go up and down the land about things relating to the return of our blessed Lord. But one thing we do know for certain, he's going to keep on doing exactly what he's doing now till the rebellion is put down and until this world is brought back under willing subjection to the rule of Almighty God. I believe if I had the time tonight, I can prove with the Scripture that everybody that God sends to hell will say amen to his judgment before he's cast into hell. And I do know that this world is going to be brought under the subjective rule of my Lord. And when it's brought there, he's going to turn it back over to the Father, saith the Bible, that God may be all in all. You know, I like to turn over in the back of the book and get answers like that. Sometimes in the flesh we get a little weary. I go from one meeting to another, and sometimes I have good meetings, sometimes the bad, sometimes it rains, and sometimes it don't, and sometimes the heavens seem to be closed, and sometimes the showers come, and we just keep going, and sometimes you get a little weary, and you'd like to take out a while, and especially I'd like to be home a while, and I couldn't take it. I'm too weak. The battle's not going so good today. But tell you right now, God's going to win the war, and rebellion's going to be crushed. Thanks be unto the Lord. Rebellion's going to be crushed. It's going to be crushed one way or another. God crushes the rebellion in the hearts and spirits of some by his wonderful wooing mercy and grace and brings men and women to wear gladly and willingly and sweetly they bow to the blessed world 
of the living Lord in their daily life. Now a man isn't saved because he believes that Jesus is Lord. The devils know that. Man isn't saved just because he says that he believes Jesus Christ has been appointed Lord of all. The devils know that. A man isn't saved. You better listen to Brother Barnum. Until he is able to worship that ascended Lord. To be saved just simply means to be changed from a rebel to a worshiper. We all have our beliefs and our doubts, but that's nothing, there's nothing to that. A man's a Christian. If by the help of Almighty God he's been able to sanctify the Lord in his heart. And he knows what worship is. <clears throat> if God Almighty, using the means he's chosen to use, is unable to crush your rebellion by his wondrous goodness, marvelous long-suffering, if went some way, if he's unable to gain your consent, to the Lordship of the Savior and your glad bowing up to it and worshiping him. Well, then the scriptures say he'll make you bow. He'll make you bow. One of the most hell-filling lies that has almost been the heart of the popular gospel for these decades of time. And men and women have been assured that they have a choice of whether they'll receive Jesus Christ or not. But they do not have a choice. God never did give you or me or anybody else a choice whether we bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have to say something I can't understand. It's just so, and I can't explain it. Men and women do have something to say, not about whether they'll bow to my Lord, but when? Whether you're going to bow to him done been settled, honey. You are. Every knee shall bow. That's not only the purpose of the gospel preaching. That's not only the purpose of the coming of Christ. But that is the set determination of Almighty God that the rebellion shall be crushed and that men shall surrender and throw down their arms. It's not a question of whether you're going to bow to Christ. You know, it's, it's a crushing load, my brethren, to share that truth in a world that don't believe it. Men and women actually think that they can dispose of Jesus Christ by keep saying no, no, no. And you and I, if we're Christians, we know they're wrong. And we wish we could get between them and a continuation of that awful course and, and just wouldn't let them go another step and we could lock them in our arms and hold them there until our mercy's gate is still open and grace still flows from the throne of God. They could be brought to a sweet bowing now. Sometimes I wish I could take men and women and shake them until they had good sense. Sometimes the preacher especially wishes he could get 
in the flesh and use tricks and methods and gadgets, but they won't work. They won't work. How helpless a person feels as he tries to witness to a priest to many women for whom one thing's been said. They must bow to King Jesus. And you wish they could be brought to the place they bow now and receive a pardon. But you can't do it. You just have to watch him. Grieve about it. But one thing's dead certain. You're going to bow. The only way on earth that God can save a rebel is to bring him to throw down his arms and surrender and cease his rebellion. If it were true that salvation becomes mine by believing some things, that'd be different. Hell be full of orthodox people, believe all the doctrines, believe the Bible from cover to cover in its letter. But salvation isn't at the end of believing some things. Salvation is Becoming vitally joined to not in this I got saved 30 year ago business but in a living daily walk with this living son of God. Amen. The apostle Paul tells us in the book of Colossians as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And it's foolish to talk about having received him if you're not walking with him. The only way God can crush the rebellion in a man's life is to cross him, to cross that man's rebellion at the point where it heads up. Do you ever have a boy? It comes to a head and it hurts. And God Almighty has to invade and meet a man where the man's in rebellion against it and cross that man's will and crush it and conquer it. Yeah. If he can't do that, he can't save a man. I say those words can't. I think from a biblical, there's something God can't do. He can't save a man any way on earth except by establishing his rule in your daily life. And he can't establish his rule in a man's life till he crushes that man's rebellious will. There never been but one question that mounted the hill of beans. Who reigns in your life? You or the Lord Jesus Christ? The devil must be cast out before the Lord's enthroned. My Lord said, you can't enter another man's house and 
set your mind, that strong man. You know the way that God Almighty can bring salvation. It's a wonderful word. It doesn't mean much now. Everybody's saved and sleeping on the road to hell. But salvation in the Bible means to be made whole and a man whole when he rejoices in being a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. All this stuff to call salvation, even our fundamental circles now that use Jesus Christ as a doormat to keep them out of hell, not interfere with the way we live. Nothing to that. Right. Nothing to that. Oh, thank God. What many good men better than I am, but this is ignorant as all get out. I've been preaching for 40 years, saying God ain't so. I've heard it till it's blue in the face that God will not violate a man's will. I'm so glad that's not so. I sure am glad he violated mine. I sure am glad he conquered my old stubborn will. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it silly to talk about being saved unless the will of God is the supreme thing in your life? Isn't it silly to talk about salvation that leaves a man still in rebellion against the will of God? My Lord said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But who? He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You say, that salvation by works? No, sir, that comes from the lips of Christ. And any salvation that doesn't bring you to the same place that did a fellow by the name of Saul or Tarsus, we're bowing prostrate. You look up and say, What wilt thou have me to do? It's high time we begin to pay a little attention to the Bible. Yet all of my life, I've preached to professing Christians that think the other fellow ought to serve the Lord. Why, I've preached to a generation of church members now for 40 years, a majority of them, that think some people ought to be missionaries. I've preached to people ever since I've been preaching the claim to the Christians and think that the other fellow ought to give full-time service to the Lord. I've preached for 40 years to a generation of church people where we actually had services where people who claimed that the Christians would surrender to do the will of God. My God, if they say they done done that. Why are people coming out of me now? That's a joke. It just can't be true that you are saved unless your face is set and you hotly to the will of God for your life. That's what salvation is. Oh, that God would split the heavens in this generation when hell going to be full of church members that had some sort of experience. The will of God doesn't mean a thing on God's earth to them. They don't know anything about salvation either. And I'm not happy about it. I just scream out against it. And I'll meet you at the judgment and tell you this is what it's all about. Your will crushed. Your will crossed. Your will conquered and God will install that salvation that salvation 
In other words, if you go to hell, it's because your will is at the place God's will must be. Somebody's got to win that battle. The Bible has a scripture that I don't know whether I know the meaning of it or not. It talks about if you offend the law at one point, you're guilty of all. I think this is what it's getting at. I just think that I'm telling the truth now. I do not know whether a single one of you people is a saved person or not. I just have no way of knowing. And so I'm not sitting in judgment or anything else. But it's always true that a man's rebellion against the authority of God, that's what means to be a law of sin, always heads up in one thing. Always rebellion! comes to her head like a boy. Every time the Holy Spirit rises these totalitarian claims of Christ upon that man, that thing like old David is ever before you. When you see men trembling under the wooing of the Holy ghost and get to hang on for dead life. It's not a matter of ignorance. It's a matter of a stronghold in their life. They're defending and not willing for it to be destroyed. Yes. None of us are perfect and don't see any angels wings. But I'm telling you right now when the man or woman boy or girl signs a peace treaty with what that whatever it is about your life that one thing you sign a treaty of peace with that and you're a dead duck my will heads up and there's one thing that will not heal. I've had men say, now, preacher, I don't want to go to hell. Well, who does? They said, preacher, I want to get saved sometime. But I'm not ready now. And they're telling the God's truth. There's something in the And they are not ready for it to be dethroned. And that's reason they're going to split hell wide open, not because there's ignorance. That's it. That's it. On the way your rebellion is. Where's it head up? Ladies and gentlemen, the least little thing can damn you to hell and keep you rejecting, rejecting, rejecting the claims of Christ until you drop him to hell. You don't have to be a big thing. It just has to be a thing that you've made an issue of. See if I can illustrate. In New Orleans, a man said to the pastor, I'll be saved, but I'll never walk that aisle. The pastor knew something about truth, and he said, You walk that aisle now, or you'll go to hell. You see, the man made an issue and told God one thing he must keep his hands off. Yeah. He said, I want to be saved, but I don't want the 
Now, man, don't have to walk the aisle to be saved. But for God's sake, don't ever tell God you won't. Because he'll bust you and he'll crush you at what you said you wouldn't do, and you'll do it. Or you'll split hell wide open over a little thing. A woman over here in West Virginia woke up the pastor at midnight and brought him over, brought, had, had him, he went seeing, here they came, woke me up about one o'clock in the morning, made me mad, he's a boo-hooing around, and she said, I just can't sleep at night, and she said, oh, I know the shape you ever saw, and I only get saved, but said, oh, my, 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 my brother's pastor of another church, and uh, if I, if I, if I, if I got saved and, and got baptized and my brother's heart, then I just not going to do that. I said, please leave, sister. I'm afraid this house will burn up. You'll be pitched into hell and scared her to death. She is telling God she wouldn't be baptized. Why well, is brought up in a generation of folks and now, honey, we're not talking about going to church. We're not talking about being baptized. We're just talking about being saved. Sass their friend. And God says, now tell you what, I won't be saved, I won't go to hell, but I ain't going to be baptized. You'll be baptized or you'll split hell wide open if you make that an issue with God. That's right. Fellow over in Beckley, West Virginia, owned a big coal mine that time. And uh, <clears throat> he had us out for dinner one time, and he telling me after dinner, he said, you know, preacher, I've made five professions of faith. And I walked behind, joined the church, and been ducked to whatever you call it, five times. And he said, I'm still lost. And he said, I want to be saved worse than the man you ever saw. But I'll never walk another aisle, and I'll never make another profession. And I got my hat, and I said, goodbye. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm scared to be around here. I said, I'm afraid God will kill you and send you to hell before I can get off your porch. You tell him, God what you won't do. And he did what he said he wouldn't do. You just can't tell God there's anything on earth he can't touch. Ladies and gentlemen, it's silly, but rebellion always heads up at one place. And it'll be crushed at that one place. And your rebellion will die over that issue. Or you'll never be safe. You'll never be safe. In Mr. Finney's day, the old squire, I guess he'd be the county judge or something now, the old squire of the village, he going out to your brother Finney, and he got on the deep conviction. And every night after Mr. Finney preached, he'd tell about two miles down, he said, there's a place of prayer. And anybody that's concerned about your soul, you go down there, and I'll meet you as soon as I can. And the old squire, he reasoned like this. He said, now, a fellow don't have to go to that place to get saved. Well, that is right. Of course he didn't have to. And then he said, I'm going to be saved, but I'm not going to go to that place. Uh oh You see, his rebellion is heading up over a little thing like that. You see? You see? What he said was so, but he made an issue out of it and told God what he wouldn't do. That's rebellion. That's your rebellious heart dictating to God instead of submitting to it. And the old boy, he come to him, Mr. Finney, he wouldn't go to the place of prayer, and he got in an awful shape, and he'd go home, get down on his knees in his bedroom, he'd just pray up a storm. Nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. They keep going here, Mr. Finn, and he'd go home, and he got in a terrible shape. And one day, it came a cloud burst of rain, and this old boy decided he'd show God how humble he was and how much he wanted to be saved. So he went from the meeting, and his big old mud hole right in front of the old squire's house. And he got out on his knees right there in the middle of the mud hole and just prayed up a storm. Nothing happened. And finally got up out of the mud hole and went where he said he wouldn't go. And God met him. God crosses a man's will at the place that will shows its rebellion against the all-out authority of Almighty God 
in your life. And if he doesn't break you there, he'll have to break you to judgment and send you to hell. But break you, he will. With me, my rebellion headed up over one thing. I think yours does too. My rebellion headed up over a call to preach. I was willing to do everything except the will of God for my life. I was reared in a godly home. When I was six years old, I'd quote ten times more scripture than I can now. He used to bring me up in these sword drills. You know what they are? Memorize and turn into scripture. Every time the doors of the church opened, Paul and Maul and us kids were there. When I was ten years old, I made profession of faith, and they baptized me. Eleven years later, before I was saved, everybody told me I was saved, and I suppose there was. Until I got up about 15 years old, I went to college. And I found out I wasn't saved. How? I had no supernatural power in here. Why I got into college life, even in a good Baptist school, there's plenty of hell going on there. And I found, you see people tell me it's hard to live a Christian life. But the Bible tells me it's not hard to live a Christian life. It's utterly impossible for anybody to live a Christian life. And the Bible says that old Rothbard has got to have Somebody living inside of it. Christ. All the devil had to do just, I had no strength big enough to resist you. You hadn't either. Unless Christ lives in there. And this is usual case for the person that's been talked into a profession of faith and all that business to find out nothing's real. That's pretty hard. And then something <coughs> began to happen to me. When I was 11 years old, missionary, call a missionary. I maintain any saved person a missionary. He just happened to be a saved person that was serving the Lord over somewhere, you know. But he came to town and he saw the strange now commune because we was all a bunch of church members living like the devil and hoping to keep out of hell, not sure. And we ain't talking about the will of God, didn't know nothing about it. You know what I'm talking about. And this he saw a peculiar fellow fellow serving God, he sort of stick out. In this day of so-called Christianity. And when he got through preaching, it wasn't scripture, but he did it anyhow. And he had a stand and saying, and he said, I wonder how many people are here tonight that would like to make a vow. See, in the language of the old song, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. What you want me to be, and so forth. Well, that sounded good to me, brother. And before I knew it, by some power, here I skied at him. And I told that fellow I would. I just as sincere as I could be. 
I wasn't saved. If a fellow had sense enough to come in out of the rain, he'd have sense enough to take a proposition like that up, wouldn't he? I didn't know I wasn't saved. But that sounded good to me. If this is God's world, me like to have this place on God's earth, fellow could be in God's world. If wherever God sent him, be in whatever God wanted him to be. And you know, the tough thing about that is, if you ever give God anything, he never does give it back. And if you ever make a vow, you may forget it, but under God, he never does. And he held my feet to the fire. To make it still worse, I didn't know about it till after the Lord saved me. But before I was born, my daddy and mother did what the old timers used to do. They gave me to the Lord to be a preacher. They didn't tell me about it. They knew about it, and the Lord knew about it. They weren't trying to help the Lord work it out. I didn't know. But God did. And my mother and father did. And of course, anybody that's ever been saved, there's something done about that four years boy. And if you save so that the will of God can be supreme in your life, then there's something done about that four years ago. And of course, the fellow's going to be a preacher, has to be called to preach before he's born. If he don't get the call before he is born, he'll never get it afterward. And I didn't know all that. But I began to go through hell on earth. I used to go here to preachers about till I was about 16, 17, and I wanted to get up there and show them how so bad I could taste it. And I knew for five long years, and this may be strange doctrine, that salvation for me meant to be a public preacher. And I believe it meant for you to do whatever the will of God is for you. For me, that was it. And I knew that surrender to King Jesus meant I'd have to be a preacher. And that was one thing I was not going to be. In my junior year in college, I received the promise of a scholarship in the world leading law university, enough to pay all of my bills. And I was approached by the head of the greatest civil law firm in Texas. But when I got out of law school, I'd come into that firm. And I loved the law and do to this day. Something fascinating about it. And I wasn't going to be a little old rag-tailed, one gallus preacher of any of that. And so I did what it seems like that most of the profession Christians have been able to do. I couldn't get the job done. I tried to get God to save me without throwing down my rebellion. But it just won't work. You just can't do it. You can call yourself a Christian until you split hell wide open. Until this matter of your rebellion where its heads up is Christ. There's no salvation. And for five years, 
I tried to get God to save me. And every time the conversation come up, this thing that was ever before me, ever before me, ever before me. You know it sounds silly, but some people don't split hell right open because of a ten cent sin. They make it an issue. And they say, I will not. And I don't care how little it is. That's where your rebellion heads up. God don't trust you, you're gone. And I know what it is to pray and cry and seek everything else. That's the reason I don't have a dime worth of confidence in all this stuff they call getting religion today, that they switch the jaw, tune them one jaw to the other and make some sort of motion, cry a little bit and call it salvation. No! This well of God business stares in a man in the face. Are you willing for the will of God to be done in your life? That's salvation. And I what? Well, a man got to have some peace. Man got to have peace. I never have a pool's drinking whiskey. If I was the average unsaved man and woman, boy, girl today, I'd stay about three-fourths tanked up with booze all the time. At least you could sleep at night. Because you, you know, <clears throat> you know, if God don't send revival in our days, this whole country is going to be one giant insane asylum. People's nerves are so raw now. Everybody got to take a pill to go to sleep and another to stay awake. It's a sign of God's earth. How near the ragged edge everybody is just exploding. Why? <coughs> Brother, the only thing that will give you real peace and soothe your nerves is a good dose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the next best thing to it is a bottle of booze. And I'd have one or the other, so help me God. Amen. I wouldn't live the way people live today, snarling and grasping and grunting and groaning and can't sleep and can't do this and can't get along with each other. Why? Brother! A man's got to have something to relax him and calm his nerves. Ain't nothing like the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Sweet will of God. You haven't got that. You're in a bad shape. In a bad shape. In a bad shape. I ain't trying to clean up this world. I ain't trying to clean up the picture shows or the beer joints or all these things. Brother, if we did, this country would go crazy. Ain't got God. Ain't got nothing to give them peace. Nothing to give them rest. Nothing to relax the old body. Haven't got the Holy Ghost. You take the booze and all this junk away from them to go crazy. And idiots can't be saved. I've seen some drunk saved, but idiots can't be. That may sound like false doctrine. You can shoot me if you want to, but ladies and gentlemen, you better listen to me. A man's got to have something help him so he can sleep at night, do his work for the day. Won't got to have something to take care of the children. Don't have the sweet peace of the will of God and the joy of the Holy Ghost. You got to have something. I had to have something. I had to have something. So I call myself an infidel. Now an infidel, is, it's spelled I-N-F-O-R-H-E-L-L, -L, in for hell. Of course, I knew there's a God, but I said, he ain't going to tell me what to do. And so I decided there wasn't one, see. I knew better. And by day I preached there is no God. And so help me God by night, I begged him to save me. That's the truth. For five years, I never went to bed at night. I'd getting down on my knees and, and, and talking to the one I'd been cussing during the day. 
and say, oh, Lord, if you won't kill me tonight, I'll surrender to you tomorrow. Of course, when the sun came up in the bar, I said, put it on that. And, you know. But a man got to have some kind of peace. man got to have a refuge. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so I got me one. And I went so far as to organize an infidel's club. God help me. The Christian cause. And every Friday night, we'd meet. We didn't have a special speaker. Uh, I, somebody else was speaking. Boy, we gave God fits. I ain't kidding you. Oh, you. With Brother Ernest, I'd go home from that meet, from that college, and get down on my knees. And vow to God if he wouldn't take me that night. I'd surrender to I scared. Oh, my. I sure am glad that God does invade people's real. I'm glad Almighty God kept after me. I'm glad he didn't cast me aside. I'm glad he didn't say, Okay, big boy, just do what you, you, you can have for now. Back the unto God. Back of my salvation is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And that's the only reason I'm saved. No reason anybody else ever gets saved. To him be the glory. I went through and graduated from that school, went out to the Panhandle of Texas to teach school, and I going to work a year before I went to law school, pay a few of my debts. And I got out there, and of course, I was a good Baptist. I was a good church member all that time. They never turned me out. They like typical church now. Anybody on God, they say, they're the easiest things on earth to get in and impossible to get out. That's the church now, mostly. And I, as a church member, will have you understand all the time. As a member of the church in a block of the campus of that school where we, I was president of the Infidel Club, they never, never bothered me. No. And so I went out that teach school. In those days, you had to be a church member if you got a job teaching in the public schools. And so the first Sunday, I marched down the aisle and joined the church by letter, you know. And, of course, I didn't go back that night. And I used to be a fool about this religion business. And sure, I didn't go Wednesday night. And Wednesday night, they had a business meeting. And I said, John Brown, they didn't let me teach you the men's Bible class. That's right. Well, I had to take it, you know. There I was. But I, I suppose they didn't know nothing about me. And I didn't, I could put on a good show, you know. And I knew more Bible. I'd learned it when I was a kid than those men did. And we just had a storm. But if I didn't go through hell, I'll choose up and take sides. And, uh, and I taught that Bible class. And, and then the preacher is I. And I went two, three Sundays and didn't have no preaching. And I went home to my boarding house from Sunday school. And I never did know why, but I went in a room and locked it. I could have got out, but I didn't want nobody to come in and bother me. And I threw the Bible down the floor and buried my face in it. And I said, Lord, whether you save me or damn me, I'll preach from now on. If ever I've got saved, that's all salvation I got. When I was able to surrender to the claims of God in Christ for me. And I don't know whether I got saved or not. I hope so. I think so, brother. I ain't cocky about it, some people. Our old time people had a hope. You know, and we, I don't know what we got. But I do know that 10 million pounds lifted off of me. And for the first time in years, I had peace. And I don't know whether that's salvation or not, but what it was, it was awful good. And so I got out of that room and I skedaddled over to the Sun School Superintendent's house. And he is sound asleep, waiting for dinner to be ready. And some of his kids had the old-fashioned Victroller playing about 100 miles an hour. And he's just sleeping up a storm. 
And I went in with my wonderful news. They turned that thing off and I woke the old superintendent up. And I said, Brother Mudd, I've come to tell you God saved me and I want to preach next Sunday. And that just ruined me. He said, it's about time. <laughs> so, and that, that just hurt me. I want them to just rejoice, <laughs> you know. And the big shot I was, you know. But he didn't. And I said, well, I don't understand it. Well, he said, things been going on you didn't know, bro. He said, before you came here, we got a couple of letters from some woman named Barnard down in Te Abilene, Texas. When I was written to the superintendent of the Sunday school, the first Baptist church, and the other to the pastor, she didn't know the name. They were identical letters. And we got them. And that old lady down there in Abilene said, My boy's coming to teach in your public schools, and he's called to preach. And he's going through hell. And I want you to build a fire under him. I don't think he can hold out much longer. He showed me the letter. That's what my mama said. And the old superintendent said, we got with the deacons and the pastor, and we framed up on it. We know knew it wasn't exactly according to all, but we took a chance, and we decided we'd build a fire on you. And said, we elected you to teach the men Bible class. And said, we've been meeting once a week, and begging God to pour cool oil on the fire and flush it out. Flush it out. Ah, oh, beloved, as God is my judge, your rebellion's got to go. Your rebellion's got to go. Let's have no more of this claiming to be friends of bloodstained Jesus when we got a shotgun pointed at his very heart saying, I will not have you to rule over me. And I go up and down the land. And I believe I tell people the truth when I say this. Don't wait. 